Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. In his 30s, he asked who would want to live forever. By his 60s, he managed to combine a very successful music career with a PhD in astrophysics and animal rights activism. Has he discovered the secret of stretching time? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by legendary Queen guitarist, Dr. Brian May. Dr. May, it's a great honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Now, I just mentioned this issue of time, and um, one of the greatest challenges in, of modern lifestyle is having it all, you know, raising a family, pursuing your career, continuing your education, and in the meantime, trying to change the world or make it a better change place. Mm -hmm. uh, you seem to be someone who has <laughs> successfully combined all of that. What's, what's your secret? Mm, well, it's, it's a great compliment that you think I do. You should talk to my wife. Um, <laughs> my wife says that I don't sleep and I'm possessed, you know, which is true, really, you know. I suppose um, you have one life and you make a choice, you know. You either kind of drift through and you do the minimum possible or you seize every opportunity to, to make a difference and that's really what I decided to do. It's not easy and it's not consistent. Um, I, I mean, really, my life is insane because it, it's astronomy, it's music, it's stereoscopy, it's animal welfare and rights and a few other things beside you know and I'm passionate about everything and I'm passionate about my family also and my wife and everything so um, it, it's a kind of insanity but in a, in a sense it keeps me going it keeps me fueled mm -hmm. and um, I, if, if I get a passion for something then I will go with it I will, I will fly by the seat of the pants if you like. I read somewhere that uh, there was a time in your life when you didn't feel you were devoting enough time to your family, to your kids, mm. and uh, this is something that I, I think a lot of people can relate to. I assume your children are now grown up. Uh, do yeah. you still have this sense of parental guilt? Have you overcome Yeah, I it? do. Yeah, I constantly feel I'm not giving my family enough. But I'm also aware that if I don't do what I'm ha having the passion to do, then I won't be a very good example to them either. Um, so, yeah, no, I do feel this, yeah. My children are big now, but I, I like to stay close. Mm -hmm. And I have grandchildren now, but I'm acutely conscious that I'm not a very good grandfather. I can only kind of lead by example. I try. I try to make the time, but it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, you were born in 1947, mm -hmm. and that made you a contemporary of uh, the Cold War. And mm -hmm. I wonder what you remember of that time because as a physicist I'm sure you would be very familiar with the concept of a nuclear winter. Did you believe back then that it was a real possibility? I was quite um, obsessed by it, yes. I used to have dreams so often of seeing the bomb and thinking, no, this is not a dream, this is real now. And I would see the flash and I would think it's just a matter of seconds before, before we're all vaporized. Yeah, I, I was very much um, dominated by that as a child, you know, and I wrote it in the song, you know, we're, we, we're a generation that grew up in the shadow of the mushroom cloud. And um, yeah, it, it was a big influence on me. Um, you know, I didn't understand the politics, of course, you know, I just understood that there was a threat there and the human race maybe was about to destroy itself. Now, you just said that you didn't understand the politics, but I think you influenced it quite a bit because I, I was obviously born in the Soviet Union and uh, I remember that Queen uh, music was, you know, your songs were one of the very few that were cleared by Soviet uh, censorship to be played on Soviet TV channels and mm -hmm. I think there is a broad understanding among historians that this hunger for Western music, including uh, music by Queen, um, played a significant role in bringing about the end of communism, the end of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Isn't it striking to you that, uh, you know, even I believe Queen, Queen's music wasn't that overtly political, it still played uh, yeah. such a big role in politics. That's very interesting. One of my best friends is Garrick Israelian who is organizing this Starmus thing and he's told me that in, in Russia and um, the, the, the countries that, that were at that time behind the Iron Curtain, it was illegal to listen to, me, to, to Queen music and he has all sorts of bootleg cassettes which he got under the table from some dealer, you know. So I know not everything that we did was allowed. But I think quite a few tunes were played on, like we had this morning show on Sunday and, uh, you know, that was, um, you know, something that was subjected to very high censorship and Queen, uh, Queen songs were regular. That's interesting. Of, of course, the, the influence underground can be more than the influence overground, you know, so I think we were something which, maybe we expressed the freedom which uh, 
these people at the time know, knew that they needed in their lives, you know, the freedom to to think their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, and it's the same year that Freddie Mercury died, and mm. I know quite a few people, including in my own family, who grieved his death, I think, more than the collapse of the country, and mm. that's a very interesting phenomenon, because, you know, that was a time when dogma and stereotypes and prejudices were still very strong, and yet somehow people could relate to him. There was, like, some... I don't know, raw humanity in him. Mm. Uh, you knew him, obviously, personally. Mm. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Why do you think people found it so easy to relate to him? Uh, that's a very big question. To us, he was our f friend, and, and much more than a friend, because a group which stays together that long is something, in a sense, more powerful than, than the marriages or, or the other relationships you have in your life. You know, we were like family to each other. So losing Freddie was was a very difficult thing for us. I mean, it took us years, I think, to adjust to losing him. Um, but he was very special, yeah. He was very shy by nature. And a, a boy who sort of experienced being kind of bullied at school. And and I, I think he, in his struggle to, to become the person that he wanted to be, he was conscious that he was an example to other people who had a similar experience. So if you see Freddie on stage being the great god, he's in a sense telling everybody right at the back of the stadium that they can do the same thing with with their lives. That's the way I see it. It wasn't conscious and he he would have laughed if if he'd seen me saying this because he was he would say, "Oh no, I'm just making music." Whatever, you know, it's it's chip paper. He was very modest about the way he was, but he did have a magnetism, I think, which was born of, of this being an ordinary man, but achieving your dreams because you're focused on your dreams. Now, that magnetism that uh, transcended uh, borders and politics, uh, mm. you, know, you, you know, I think the case could be made that, uh, you know, in this day and age, people's ability to see each other for what they are is diminishing because there are a lot of invisible lines. I mean, you know that there's a, a rising tensions between Russia and the West, and Ban Ki Moon just the other day said that uh, there is a ghost uh, of the Cold War hanging mm. around. Uh, we mm. also have this issue of uh, ISIS, uh, you know, people who, mm. you know, define themselves th themselves in opposition to the rest of us. Uh, why do you think uh, something like that is uh, happening in this day and age? Because we, uh, you know, a few years ago, it seemed that, you know, we left it all behind. That's a very big question. <laughs> well, but you, a cosmopolitan um, man, you travel the world, you know yeah. people. I think there are many levels to this. Um, you know, you say we traveled a lot. Yes, we did travel, and we still do. And it gives you a privileged view, a privilege in the good sense of the word privilege, because you see people real, you see people natural. And, for instance, we were in Argentina at the time when all this tension was between Britain and Argentina, and we were so conscious that these young Argentinian boys and girls were just the same as us, just the same as our boys and girls. And you realize that it's really the politicians who mess it all up. You know, the rest of us just want to have a peaceful life, and we want to bring up our family. We want art, we want music, we want love. And, unfortunately, politicians uh, put us at war with each other. That's my view. You know, and the politicians of my country... I have seen a lot now, you know, you say I travelled, mm -hmm. now I travelled in, in the House of Commons, I spend a lot of time there lobbying for animals, and what I see is horrible, it's disappointing, because you see people who are running the country who basically care most about getting re-elected, it's all about they want to keep their power, and so they calculate every move to try and get votes, and it's pitiful to watch, it's awful. This is the opposite of what politicians right. should be. They should be there to represent the people who put them there. They should be representing um, morality and trying to make the, the world a better place. This is way out of their agenda, most of them. There's a few good politicians, but you could probably count them on the fingers of one hand in, in England. And I know that the politicians of other countries are the same. You know, unfortunately, the people who get attracted into politics are the wrong people. They're the people who want to have personal power and ruthlessly will push everybody out of the way to achieve that power. Now, you just said a, a moment ago that when you were in Argentina, you saw that, you know, Argentinians were people like 
you know, yourself. And mm. Sting, I remember, I think it was in the early 80s, yes. wrote that song about the Russians that this we apparently <laughs> love our children too. And he mm -hmm. was talking about uh, a threat of a nuclear explosion, yeah. nuclear mm -hmm. winter. And, you mm. know, just the other day, um, you know, we, we heard uh, Russian and American uh, politicians talking about, you know, that country's uh, nuclear arsenal. Do you think mm. something like that could become a real threat once again? Well, of course, I hope not. <laughs> I don't. I don't know enough to know if that's possible. Of course, I hope not. And um, unfortunately, the media play a big part of this as well. I think you know. And there's a lot of you know. I see a lot of America. I'm English, but I spend a lot of time in America. And you see um, things like Fox TV, who will report only the aspects which they want to report, and it will be absolutely pro-American. It will have no balance, you know, and so it will be very anti-Russian. Mm -hmm. And if people see this, then they get a distorted view of the world. And actually, the British media are pretty much as bad, I would say. You know, you, you read the Telegraph, you do not get a, a balanced view of, of, of the world or even the country we live in. Now, you mentioned this anti-Russian sentiment, and uh, mm -hmm. one of the consequences of that is that a number of Western artists have already uh, cancelled their tours in mm. Russia. A number of Western um, countries cancelled their major cultural events mm. and uh, that led me thinking if you, that I would like to ask you rather, if you believe that music and art perhaps become more attuned, more dependent on political considerations than uh, when you were touring the world. Well, these questions have come up all the time. You know, this, this question came up with us when uh, we wanted to go to South Africa. And everybody said, if you play in South Africa, you are betraying uh, Western morality or whatever, and you will be endorsing apartheid. Now, it wasn't true. The people who say this kind of stuff are the people who sit in their armchairs and never go anywhere. So my view is perhaps controversial, but I think that if you refuse to go to a country because of the politicians, you wouldn't go anywhere. You know, so to me, the important thing of music and art is to cross these barriers and you play to people. We, South Africa is a good example. We went to the only place where we could play in a non-segregated environment and we spoke our mind and we met people. I met people of all colors, all persuasions. And we were able to, in, because we said what we felt, we were able to be part of, of what was going on and influence what's going on. So to me, the great thing, maybe the greatest thing about music and art is that it can unite people. And the unity of normal, common people is the strength that will head off the politicians with their insane missions of power. Mm -hmm. If I can continue uh, on this interplay between music and politics, uh, I mentioned the Islamic State earlier, this uh, terrorist group, and one of the first things they do on the territories they control is to ban music, both mm. uh, local mm. and domestic. And mm. I wonder, uh, as a musician, if you believe that this ban is even sustainable in the long term. Can people live without uh, melody, without singing, without dancing? Wow, oh, it's horrible. I mean, I, I do find that very frightening. Anything which limits people's freedoms in any way is, is horrible and terrifying and, and backward looking, you know. And I think the ISIS is truly terrifying. Um, I don't have the answers uh, to your question. I, I mean, there have been societies and there are societies as we speak that are very repressed and it does happen, yeah. But uh, I think people always find a way in the end to, to reclaim their freedoms. Well, Dr. May, we have to take a very short break now, but when we come back, have we come to a point where we have to choose between animal and human rights? That's coming up in a moment on Worlds Apart. Welcome back to Worlds Apart, where we are discussing life and music with Dr. Brian May. Uh, Dr. May, uh, I know you're very passionate about animal rights. A few weeks ago, you lent your support to uh, a campaign against the uh, badger call in the UK. Absolutely. I wonder what draws you to this cause of animal rights? It's a fundamental belief, really. I mean, I believe that we, the human race, have got it completely wrong. Um, as an astronomer, I'm very conscious that we thought uh, humans were the center of the universe for a very long time. 
um, the, the Ptolemaic system has the Earth at the center of the universe and everything goes around it. Now we discover that's not true. We discover we're, we're living on a piece of rock which rotates around a sun and that sun is a very small star in a very, very large galaxy. That galaxy is a, a normal galaxy among billions of galaxies. So to me it's, it's a kind of, it's something that I don't even question, you know, that, that there is no reason to put us at the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, similarly, if you look at the, the animal kingdom, um, the human race thinks that it's the only import, important species on this planet. Now, to me, there is no basis for that either. Why would you assume that just because we can build roads and concrete and, uh, and tweet each other, why would we think we are a more important species than the rest of the, the animals on this planet? To me, there's no, there's no justification for this belief. It's a sort of humanocentric concept. But it's become very prevalent. Um, and that's the way we run this planet. Every, every time there is a conflict between what we want and what the animals want, we don't care. We just destroy their environment, destroy them, we eat them, we experiment on them. And if there's a problem between, say, farming and wildlife, you will just destroy the wildlife. Now, that's what's going on in my country. You know, there's a problem in farming, which was made by farming, by intensive farming. It's called bovine TB. And it has affected the wildlife around farms. Now, what's happening with this government is they say, OK, well, we won't change anything in the farming community. We'll just kill all the wildlife, and that will solve the problem. Now, first of all, it's immoral, in my view, because of what I've just said. Why would you assume that our needs are more important than, say, the badgers, who have been actually living in Britain longer than we have? Secondly, it's inhumane, because they don't care how they kill them. Thirdly, it's scientifically completely without justification because it's been shown time and time again that if you kill the wildlife, it does not solve the problem. Um, it's also even economically unsound because they're at the present time spending £4,000 to kill one badger. Uh, so it will add up to billions of pounds to eradicate the badgers. And how could you do such a despicable thing? So to me, yes, I'm fighting our government very hard and I believe we will win in the end. Well, obviously this uh, issue is very pressing not only in the UK, uh, it is even more pressing, let's say, in Africa. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was a roving reporter in the past and I wa once was covering, um, you know, this huge migration from Africa into Europe, from Italy. And one of the migrants told me that, you know, these Europeans, that they care more about giraffes and zebras than they care about us and yeah. that sounds very bitter but isn't that ultimately true? I think that's a distorted view. I think if we take care of all the creatures on this planet the question should not arise. It's, it should not be a question of is it us or is it them? It should be a question of is it all of us, you know? And to me it's much more than populations, you know, it's individual creatures, you know. It's supposing I tell you, you know, I'm going to save the human race but actually I have to kill you and I have to kill you in a horrible way which will cause you lots of pain. Do you accept that view? I don't think so. So to me it's not just about, say, preserving a giraffe population, preserving a rhinoceros population. Yes, that's important. But what is also important is the welfare of every single rhinoceros. That means it's, it's physical health and it's mental health. And, uh, you know, if you have a load of distressed animals around, what have you achieved? But, uh, I mean, it's still clear that um you know, this concept of animal rights, it is derived from the concept of human rights. And uh, you can see how the, these two issues could come into direct conflict, especially again in Africa, where security challenges are so pressing, where poverty is a major issue. Where do you draw the line for yourself uh, when you have to prioritize one, one against the other? Humans against animals. I, as a, again, I don't think that is a legitimate conflict. Suppose I said to you, you have to choose between killing one of your ch children and the other, and I would say, this is a conflict for you. You'd say, yes, but it's an artificial conflict, because that should never happen. But, right? uh, well, let me give you the example of Africa. The, uh, I think the more we do to protect basic human rights, the more you give people food, shelter, mm -hmm. you know, water, the more likely it is that the populations are going to grow and um, they will continue encroaching onto the habitat of other species. And the case could be made that uh, the only way to protect wildlife is to agree in legal terms that, for example, a baby gorilla is no less valuable than a, you know, a human baby. But uh, would you be willing to accept that? And is society ready for that transition? Again, I think, you're, I think it's an artificial question because what, 
one thing is very certain, you know, there are too many people on this planet. And, and because there are too many and people... And that's a threat for animals, I mean... Well, it's a threat for us, I mean... <laughs> my, my, it's that's a threat true. for us. Because there are too many of us, we are destroying our environment, which includes the animals. So to me, you know, animal rights is not in conflict with human rights. Animal rights is an extension, a logical extension of human rights. You know, so supposing you said, you know, I believe in human rights, but, but you know, we, we think Europeans are more important than Africans, then I would say, yeah, okay, you're seeing a conflict there, but basically you've got your ideas wrong. You know, it's not about who, is, who takes priority, it's about protecting the whole environment, the whole population. And the population to me includes animals. But how can you protect people in Africa without endangering animals? I mean, I don't... See. Oh, very easily. Of How? course you protect people in Africa. You know, I mean, if, if their livestock is being eaten by um, lions or whatever, you build fences. And that's what, that's what a lot of these people do. You know, you don't go out and kill all the lions. And, you know, that's the same philosophy in England. And, and of course, what's happening is it's not just poverty in Africa which is driving um, the, ex the extermination of the rhino. It's money from outside. It's the fact that Chinese medicine wants rhino horn in... Uh, supposedly to cure diseases, which is nonsense, as we all know. But what you do is, you, you and what the workers do there, is, is to make sure that these people who need uh, an income for their family, they derive it from protecting the animals and not from killing them. Mm -hmm. So you encourage ecotourism, for instance, you know, and you encourage these people to treasure the animals that are around them so that they can share them with the rest of the world, in a sense, and, and they can look after the animals. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. You don't have to go around killing things with guns in order to protect humans. Now, we already discussed a number of hypotheticals of how people can end life on this planet. I mean, nuclear winter, you know, killing the infidels uh, mm. proposed by uh, ISIS, a major pandemic. Which of these, uh, or perhaps other, um, you know, outcomes you, you believe are, is more likely to end life on this planet or significantly reduce the number of people? Oh, well, there are a number of things which are going to end life before all that. You know, one of them is a meteor strike, which is very likely at this point, you know, and there was a great lecture last night saying how little we are doing to guard against being completely wiped out by a meteor strike. And that's one of the things that I'm concerned with. I, I actually, I'm a, I'm a member of Sentinel, and what we're hoping to do is to be better at discovering what's coming towards us earlier so we can do something about it. And there are super volcanoes which can also destroy the, the whole planet. And, a, and certainly a disease like Ebola, uh, if it becomes airborne, you know, as it could do by mutation, would do a pretty good job of, of, of wiping out the human race, I think. Probably not completely. But close, you know. So, but these things are um, these things are largely beyond our control. And um, well, but mass killing, like nuclear winter, for example, would be mm. pretty much within our reach. Yeah, we could do that to ourselves. Yeah, I mean, one hopes that we won't. It, it's possible that tragic accidents could happen. Interesting. The chap last night he was talking about you know meteor strike can look very much like a an atomic bomb and it could be misunderstood and that could escalate into a nuclear war. That's a very frightening possibility. Now, um, you wrote one of my favorite songs speaking about uh, apocalyptic predictions. Uh, you wrote that song about who wants to live forever and, mm. um, you know, to me at least it's, uh, it's a song about the universe and our very humble place in it, but I wonder if I'm reading too much into it. Is that really the way you feel about life or perhaps it's just, just a song? It's just a song, so a song is not important. No, well, I mean, so, well, some writers write songs just because. Yeah, but they, the they point of writing a song them. is that you shouldn't be explaining it, really. Otherwise, you would have just. Do you believe in, in the lyrics that uh, you wrote? Do you? Do I, of course, I believe in my lyrics. I wrote the song. Of course, I believe it. Because I mean, you wrote it when you were, I think, in even under your forties, and since then you have experienced a lot of traumatic events in your life. Mm. Um, if you had to write it now, would you change anything? No. No. <laughs> Why would I change it? Well, just wondering. Um, you see, I think you're looking as, at a song as the same as a text. It's not the same. A song is something which you write, uh, which expresses your feelings and, uh, and you hope that it connects with other people's feelings. But it's not um, tied down every word like, like a piece of text would be. Um, so a song can mean something to me 
it can grow in me even when it's out there. It, it also grows in ideas in other people, and everybody has their own interpretations. So the, the thing you should not really do is start pulling a song to pieces and saying, what does this mean, what does this mean? Because then you destroy the song. You know, it would be easier just to write an essay about life and death or whatever. A song is something very personal to me. That's the way it started. But songs, if they, if they work for people, get into their body and soul, you know. And so someone who listens to Who Wants to Love a like, like, like yourself, maybe, you hear it the way you want to hear it. And if you like it, that makes me happy because it means that you, you, you're in resonance with some of the, the, the thoughts and feelings in there. But it's not an easy thing to define, is it? I mean, I'm not laying down the law in Who Wants to Live Forever. I'm just saying this is how I feel at this moment. Now, um, it may come across as a bit strange to you, but uh, I think most of us Queen fans um, don't know and will never know where uh, Freddie Mercury's ashes were buried. That was his, uh, his wish, I know. But uh, what I was, was going to ask you, if you have an, any idea of why he left such instructions, because, I mean, my little theory, and uh, it, pr it is probably wrong, is that uh, he may have uh, resented this idea of uh, you know, having this symbolic termination to his life, like burial, for example. Did he want to live forever? Was he the kind of person who would uh, consider that option? I mean, forever, at least in the, in the memory of his fans. You'd have to ask him. I can't answer that for Freddie. You know, I, I wouldn't presume to ask the boy. Freddie lived very much in the moment, and that was his philosophy, and he didn't waste his time on anything that he thought was unimportant. That's his philosophy, really, you know. Um, I don't think he was obsessed with um, being immortal in any way whatsoever. I think he was driven by wanting to live life to the full, experience life to the full, and share his feelings with, um, with the world. Um, I don't think he really gave much thought to the fact um, that you know there was immortality or whatever. You know, I think he just wanted to to make the mo make the most of what he was doing. Well, Dr. May, uh, thank you very much for your time. And to our viewers, please keep the conversation going on our Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook pages. And I hope to see you again, same place, same time, here on Worlds Apart.